Welcome to this week's episode of the O Ship Show, where we dive into the transformative world of technology with the spotlight on the future right before our eyes virtual reality, mixed reality, and spatial computing. Today, we're joined by Lucky Gobindram from CXR Agency, a pioneer at the forefront of crafting immersive experiences that meld the digital and physical realms in unprecedented ways. As some of the first to explore the capabilities of the Apple Vision Pro, they're here to peel back the curtain on the real impact of XR technologies. Are we on the brink of a new era in how we interact with technology, or is this just another wave of the digital ocean? Stay tuned as we unravel the reality of these cutting edge technologies and why they might just redefine our digital future. Lucky, welcome to our ship. How are you? I'm um, well. Thanks for having me, Freddie. Uh, well, what I didn't disclose in the intro is I you know, may have set you up as a pioneer for this, but I'd like to our audience, you are one of my geek buddies, and I mean that as highest compliment. So for those of you who've never tuned into O Ship before, I happen to be a diehard VR guy. So I spend a lot of time in VR uh, whether I'm mucking around professionally or going on VR dates with my wife. And so I have to be honest, I have a little bit of job MB of Lucky who gets to kind of work in this stuff all day long for some great brands in, you know, across VR, XR. And you may notice over his shoulder is an Apple Vision Pro sitting over there, which I am very jealous of today. And Lucky's going to share a little bit about what that experience has been like and maybe put the device on for us. So, But we're going to get to that later in the episode. I'd love to kind of start off by helping our audience understand a little bit more about you, You're Lucky, and what the hell inspired you to venture in this crazy world of mixed reality and VR to begin with? So yeah, Freddie, happy, happy to dive in. You know, I started in this space formally about 15 years ago, building technology for a living with my elder brother, who has been a geek with me our whole lives, right? We have grown up in the household of an inventor that built all types of hardware. And it was a natural next step for us to start looking at software and how that starts to eat the world, right? And from a spatial perspective, it was, I don't know, seven, eight years ago during Thanksgiving time. I think it was 2014, right? Maybe it's 10 years ago now when the Google Cardboard launched. And that was the first moment, right? We bought the cardboard. We set it up on Thanksgiving morning. We were playing with it. And you know, all of a sudden, I was in places I could never imagine being, learning and seeing things that you know, were traditionally shared through a 2D screen. And all of a sudden, I was immersed. And from that point on, we started looking at the functional use cases and how it could be applied to practical you know, benefits for humanity and businesses. And this is how we began to dive into this realm of computing. Yeah, I was also an early user. It's one of those things where like, I wanted it to get real for a long time. And I think you've been able to find clients who are able to work with these kind of emerging technologies, which is, again, super exciting. When do you feel like it really started feeling uh, real, you know, in terms of it, like, you know, starting to feel like it's really getting into the mainstream? I, I don't know if it's at a full-fledged mainstream level yet, Freddie, right? Mm -hmm. And I think we're, we're starting to see it, right? When you think about the Apple Vision Pro being a generation one, and this is the worst Apple headset we'll ever see, mind-blowing, mind-bending, right? Like, but, you know, if I look at, like, aha moments, you know, I think the original Quest was the first step, right? And Meta's done a very good job of pioneering spatial, or they call it AR, VR use cases, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's some things that it just had gaps and was gating to true productivity or true you know, utilization for long extended periods, right? And candidly, over the last six days, I have logged greater than 50 hours in my Vision Pro, right? And it's amazing. I would never do that on my Quest 3. I couldn't do that on my Quest Pro, right? Not perfectly comfortable, but is it 70% more comfortable than all the other headsets that I've ever been in? Likely, right? And, wow. you know, I think... We are at an impasse of the technology right now that we're starting to see the prowess because we're able to do a lot of different things. Earlier today, working in a cafe after a meeting, and all of a sudden, you know, I had, you know, 
uh, a movie running on a hundred inch screen. I had my email up. I had my Mac desktop. I was getting iMessages and able to jump into FaceTimes when they call me and have a collaboration session, right? These are things that were never possible. If I was in a movie in my Quest 3 or any other spatial headset for that matter, you're in the movie, right? You're immersed in the movie and you're not doing anything else. All of a sudden you have this paradigm where you are really able to toggle, pivot, and be flexible and work. So you are in a world where it's never been charted. You know, what I love about that is, first of all, I'm trying to imagine you in this restaurant. And as a guy who's used to the MetaQuest 3 uh, quite a bit, which is also mixed reality, you know, look, I can kind of see my way around the room and things like that. But I couldn't you know, necessarily do a lot of stuff. I don't think I'd be you know, hanging out at a restaurant trying to eat a meal in it or something like that. I find it's good for kind of navigating around the room and I can find my mouse and keyboard if I'm doing some PC VR. But, but I think what you're describing is a totally different um, experience. So I guess the, the thing that this really makes me think about is like, okay, and you start imagining a world where kind of everyday people are all of a sudden starting to interact with kind of XR technologies when they get to this level, mm-hmm. you know, I guess what kind of everyday experiences are going to ch- start changing for the average person? Oh, man. You, so I'll lead into <laughs> what I'm actually experiencing myself, right? So right now, if you look at my environment, if I put my Vision Pro on, right, if I walked around my house, like if you go to the, the fridge, there's a note it's there of like things I may need to do or like, you know, and, and the beauty of actually the Vision Pro is, and it's kind of wild, right? If I put a window here, I go somewhere else and come back. The window is pinpoint where I left it, right? So I can leave windows wherever I want. It's remembering my spaces, right? It's wild. It's amazing, right? Like all of a sudden you can start layering your real world. And there are some already practical use cases that are changing the way people are living and functioning when they have the device, right? So there's one that, you know, you could work with recipes. It can see what's in your fridge. It can, you know, help you through the process of making dinner, right? These are things that, you know, at stages where it gets layering AI and starts, you know, having an LLM when Apple decides to listen, it knows everything about me from my iMessage to my email to everything else. And like, it's all tied in. It knows your food preferences. You know, and it starts adding value to your everyday circumstances, situations, and habits, right? And that's when it's a game changer for the everyday person, obviously form factor needs to slid a little bit along the way. Yeah. For some people who watch the show may not be aware of something called Google Glass from back in the day. Oh, and it kind of created this tiny little lens. I think it was on this side, if I remember right. correctly. You can kind of look down and see stuff, but this isn't spatial computing. This was like having a little see-through kind of, you know, thing that you could pull up more information on. It did have a camera. You could record some video, but these are... Totally different worlds. But one thing that the Google Glass did create, I believe they called them glass holes, on a, glass you know, holes. Is not, was not the, exactly the best branding thing that ever happened for Google. And i never forget was the, the tech influencer, uh, uh, Robert, uh, who I keep liking his last name, who basically was in the shower, you know, uh, to each season. Robert Scoble. Yes, Robert Scoble. I actually I know Robert. You know, Robert basically was like, I'm not taking this thing off for whatever it was, 90 days. It took a photo of him in the shower. And then that was like, that, again, not exactly the branding image that they wanted yeah. shared all over Twitter at the time and things like that. Where I'm going with this anyway is, so one of the things I've seen since the release of the Apple Vision Pro, now on TikTok and things like that, I'm seeing these videos of kind of guys walking down the street. And I personally think it's all theater. They're just not interacting with how I think the device actually yeah. works. But what I worry about is this kind of like that it becomes a joke. You know what I mean? And I wonder if the actual substance of this device, like I, the substance of the Google Glass wasn't enough maybe to counteract the jokes, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? But like, <laughs> is the value and the substance really be like, yeah, bro, you can make some jokes, but the stuff that I'm doing in this will like melt your brain. And I'm not necessarily Google Glass with like gave people the ammo to say it's worth it. It's worth wearing this because what I'm doing like is changing my life. Does that make sense? 
It does make sense. So, you know, yeah. it is jokes what people are doing online, just to clear yeah. that up. Yeah. If you're yeah, moving yeah. with the Vision Pro on it, the windows disappear, right? Yeah, yeah exactly you, right. you can't use it on the subway. You can't yeah, use yeah. it on a bus or in a car, right? Yeah. The windows won't hold, right? They place them. Yeah. If you sit down somewhere, anywhere in the world, in your home, anywhere, you can yeah. start, you know, dropping windows and placing them a lot, pull them next yeah. to you, make them bigger, right? But you need to be in a stable position where you're not moving yeah. at you know, a speed that's untenable for it to manage the environment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that, you know, glass holes, I was one of them. I definitely bought the first gen. I was walking uh, around New York City, riding city bikes with it on the whole nine. It gave me directions. It added some values, but, you know, it just didn't do the same thing. And, you know, it's a joke right now with Apple Vision Pro because of all the hype and people might go viral, yeah. right? But, like, yeah. the truth that it is, like, having it with you, like you have a laptop, and actually being able to put it on and, and start being productive or, or just consuming content and enjoying yourself is unparalleled, right? And, and that's where I think it's wildly crazy, right? So you think about like, okay, the philosophies, right? Of like meta versus Apple, right? And, and, and where they're looking at spatial and 3D, right? So the philosophies of how to build the spatial computing world are just divergent right around you know previous hud manufacturers and people that are trying to stand up the space versus what apple is doing right so traditionally if you look at what a lot of people have been working on and trying to achieve and you know the way they designed it it's in line of something called skeuomorphism right and Skeuomorphism is a design paradigm where you are mimicking the real world, right? So digital twinning the real world to be able to put you in a virtual equivalent, right? Which is great. Don't get me wrong. It has like its value also, but I don't think that's where the spatial world naturally goes. You don't want more of the real world and the virtual world. You want to layer the real world with spatial things to benefit the real world, if that makes sense. Right, yeah, and hundred percent. Where Apple is going to have to continue to learn and grow is that you know today, if I use their native controllers, right, which is great, like you know, my yeah. eyes are the mouse. I can look at something and you know, use a little gesture on my lap to tap, right. But if I try using the two D web, like you know, and I'm trying to go like something on Twitter or X, I should say, or you know, I'm trying to click a link, it's not as built for those functions and behaviors, right? You're still instinctually like, let me pull that window closer to me and let me tap, right? And I think Apple is just gonna have to enrich their library of interactions to start doing this, but there are paradigms where like you could pull your desktop screen, place it on your lap like an iPad, and all of a sudden you are yeah. using iPad gestures, right? And, and like, it feels very natural in those types of cases amazing i don't know if i'm gonna jump on it because i'm not in the apple ecosystem but i, I have high hopes that you know, some other major players are going to put some things out in, in the next 12 months if they don't i'm going to crumble I think. <laughs> get back into apple just for this one thing so yeah amazing there's so much potential here as someone who ends up you know working with a lot of clients who aren't just early adopters where they have to looking at something like this and you're saying, look, I can't just do this because I think it's cool. And I can't just do it because I think it's neat. And I've got, you know, P&L responsibility. Or you're a senior leader in an organization. You know, what advice do you have ultimately for businesses who are looking to integrate you know, XR technologies into their operations? So I think as a business looks at it, right, there's tried and true use cases that make it easy to pilot and lean in, right? Things that are evident when you look at like, say, training and simulation, right? We can already tell that every trainee and trainer pair will save $23,000 to an enterprise by doing this in spatial, right? If you multiply that across an organization that has tens of thousands of employees, the saving is not a drop in the bucket, right? Or if you look at certain workflows that are today relegated to 2D and, you know, they're just not as beneficial, right? Like, when I'm viewing some sort of design asset that is, you know, a real world type thing, like how can I pass it to you, right? And all of a sudden we can view it together. Like similar to the, what I was saying when you're using Reality Kit and you're able to iMessage a 3D file to me and I, I'm able to like look at it and, and be able to comment on it in a FaceTime with you, right? So things that add productivity in those ways are very evident and clear. 
right? And I think that we are, as a culture, starting to explore some of these unfounded paradigms, right, that are, you know, more unknown today. Right. But I think that there are a lot of just basic business use cases that have lost the depth and understanding and personal collaboration that all of a sudden, if you use tools like this, you are able to gain a lot more value through the communication and the retention and the behavior. So, you know, I was not actually that familiar with how people are using these technologies. I, I don't know how I was visualizing it. I think I've seen things where it's like, oh, it's engineers interacting with schematics and that's training and things like that. And how do you work on an engine? And, and but, I, you know, I recently started looking at some examples. I was inspired, you know, as I knew we were chatting today, you know, where it's like, hey, it's a customer service agent or a front desk clerk in a hotel and you're actually interacting with a guest and how do you talk to them and how do you deal with these questions and i was like man that is powerful stuff you know a lot of these things in training sessions in corporate environments historically have basically been like role playing role playing is weird no one likes doing it it's awkward for everyone involved but when you start saying no no boom you're there you're at the desk you're talking to a young woman and, you know, two children. Oh, you're talking to an elderly couple. Oh, you're talking to a disgruntled person. And they're having to interact in these experiences and it feels photorealistic. I mean, this is powerful stuff. And I get it. Cost of savings from going to training facilities. The ability to do this on demand without putting workshops together. The fact that it's even more realistic, it's just powerful. I can see how this could be a huge opportunity for people. Yeah, a friend of your use case, so when you're suggesting of retail, is very real. Actually, you know, we are working with one of the largest luxury retailers in the world. And, you know, that's where we're leaning in, right? You know, the first thing we did was actually armed robbery training, right? What do you do when somebody comes in and tries to brazenly rob a store, right? Like, what are the protocols? What are the behaviors? And, okay, how do you use a POS system, or, you know, what do you do in the case of unruly customer, right? Or how do you handle upselling, right? And all these things are much better served in this manner than through a 2D L&D platform where the, the person is, you're checking their text messages or, you know, doing a million other things. Maybe they have YouTube up and they're watching that and, you know, like they're just letting it play in the background to select the answers to, to pass it all right i thought about that it's a great angle like it requires your total engagement there's no way to multitask your way out of it basically that's For fascinating sure. so on that note this is a great example something just happened that i was like i had not thought of that and i'm certainly you know nowhere near as immersed as you are and i suspect our audience is nowhere even immersed as i am so there's probably some pretty big misconceptions that are out there is there any misconception that you find commonly out there, whether it's XR, MR, VR, whatever it is, perceptions that people have of what this technology is and how it should be applied and kind of, you know, the reality of it? I don't know. One of, the, one of my favorite ones, you know, is that people are like, 3D isn't that big of a deal. Except the digital twin has, I'll use you know, polite language, a lot more resolution, right? Or, you know, it hurts to wear. Who does it? Any generation of technology has its growth stages. There's a million of them from the early adopter standpoint that people have friction points around what it is or, you know, I don't have a use for it. You know, I think about this very much, Freddie, like, you know, when I was a child, right, the PC was new, right? And if you ran into people, it's like, oh, I'm just going to a library, here's the PC. I don't need one of those. Right. Or it's like, you know, you know, it's like all these things are like, oh, I don't need one in my house. Like what happened to that guy or gal? Right. They're a little bit of a dinosaur today. Right. Like the world shifts. And like, guess what? We all carry them around. In fact, they're not even in backpacks as laptops anymore. They're in our pockets as phones. And now we have supercomputers on us and it's subsidized by a carrier. And like, yes, yeah. this has to be paid for yourself. But like the truth of it is, you're at the same sort of like adoption curve, right? Where you're going to see the slow incline and you're going to start to see people start benefiting from it that they're going to be like, whoa, how did I ever yeah. do it that way? Right? Yeah. Yeah. There's another misconception that I'm worried that anyone who's watching the show right now might be thinking. And, you know, both like, you know, our heavy, you know, users and, and headset users. And I know what you're thinking. 
A VR does not actually make you go bald. This was just something that we happened to us naturally. <laughs> Nothing to do with VR, MR. And at Apple, you know, the Vision Pro will not make you go bald. Just as yeah. our thing. <laughs> I think we look good, Freddie. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. I'd love actually to take a look at the Vision Pro. Would you be up for sharing it with us? Yeah, let me show it to you. So this is the headset, right? This is the battery pack that goes with it. It fits nicely in your pocket. You know, if you put it on. I switched the, the strap pro to the other strap of the dual. I find that to be more comfortable for long extended use, actually. Um, heavy user hours tip. this week. It's wild. And it fits on really nicely. And, you know, you, you can take you anywhere you want, right? And this thing, it just like slips into your pocket. It, wow. it is amazing, Freddie. Like, and, you know, I can go yeah, sit on my couch. That's I can, the, the thing where, you, where apparently you can see your eyes through it. Will that come through the camera, you think? It would or, come through the camera, Freddie. Uh, yeah, I can see the reflection of us on the screen more like, that's amazing. Is it turned on as soon as you put it on? You can shut it down or you can turn it on yeah. and boot it up. Yeah. First thing it does, it scans your eyes, okay? And then once it scans your eyes, it unlocks the device. Okay. Amazing. And once the device is unlocked, depending what you have up in screens or whatnot, you, you can see them, right? And then if you hit this crown button right here, right, yep. it will evoke your home screen of all your apps, right? And then you could, you know, slip through your apps, okay? And then if you look at an app and open it, it opens in front of you, and there's a little bar on the bottom that you can move in, in and around and place it where you want. And then next to that bar, there's a little dot you can close the window, right? I'd say I'm reading something. I could scroll through it, scroll it. If I want to make it bigger, I reach the bottom left, I size it, and I have a huge window. I could place it over there, right? And you know, I can have many things going on at the same time, it, wow. and it's seamless, right? I guess because you can see through it perfectly, it'd be perfectly easy to use with a keyboard and mouse and, and no issues there whatsoever. Oh, absolutely, Freddie. So, like, you know, they have their own keyboard, and it's it's quite comfortable to use the virtual keyboard. I don't find that to be problematic, right? Uh -huh. But if I wanted to use it with my Mac, yeah. I have a, a three-monitor array set up, so I would have to unplug yeah. it from my monitor array. So it's actually one of the pain points that I didn't realize at first, but, I, you know, they'll get so you. have to unplug your monitors for it to register it as a monitor, basically. Correct. I'm sure so that's fix that. You can only have one desktop at a time, right? So at first I was like, maybe I can have three desktops up. But, like, you know, you don't really need that because you have Safari natively. You have all these other things yeah. natively that you can do all the things that you're doing. But if you want your desktop natively, you can only have one of it. And it can't be plugged into another array, right? But it, would be old, 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 old browsers, right? <laughs> That's yeah. wild. I could see how that could be a, a little bit addictive. We've got a guy at Camillion Collective who is a diehard VR guy. He spends his entire day, basically. He even joins every meeting as a, his avatar. And, and he's you know, always using this kind of, uh, you know, immersed, you know, kind of environments with all his multi-screens. And he absolutely swears by the product of the impact of it. Uh, and I can only imagine this is like that on steroids. Yeah. Immersed is fantastic. So I've used Immersed a lot, actually, in my quest. And it, it, it's great. Right, it's a nice co-working space, three monitors, but it doesn't solve for what the Vision Pro is doing, right? So, like, you know, where it gets really interesting is this, right? If you look at the chipset array of the Vision Pro versus the chipset array of, you know, another device, right? And you know, a Meta Quest Two is running a Snapdragon, okay? And a Snapdragon is good, but like, if you look at what the M2 and uh, the R2 chips within the Apple device can do, it's just so much more powerful, right? Like if you're thinking about like, they have one chip just running the camera array, right? And then yeah. like, you know, and that's why you're able to play so much stuff and do all these things and, you know, keep all these things there, right? So the dual chip design enables spatial experiences of Apple, Apple Vision Pro that are unparalleled, right? I mean, they have their own native silicone. And that's like- you know, I, mean, it's, I mean, I guess the difference well, is that the MetaQuest is effectively using a mobile chip where you'd like you find a smartphone. And these guys are basically using laptop chips inside the headset. Yeah, they're using the M2 chip, which is Apple's laptop chip. But then that secondary chip is a specialized spatial chip, right? When you're using that, the Apple R1, right, in there, like, you know, you're getting a much different experience, right? It's wild. And you, know, you start pairing it like, I have all my iPad apps. It's mind blowing, right? I love it. So just being conscious of time, I wanted to say, like, for starters, 
super cool. I'm so glad we were able to get together, especially so close to you, just getting your Apple Vision Pro and being able to kind of talk about some virtual things in a very tactile way. But, you know, it wouldn't be O-Ship if I didn't ask you for an O-Ship question. So you've been doing this for a long time. You've had a lot of experiences, good, bad, obviously end of the spectrum. But I would love to hear about a moment from your career where maybe things didn't go as planned. And we like to call that on this show, a no ship moment where things were a little bit off the rails. And I think it's important for other entrepreneurs and technologists and early adopters who might be watching this episode today to kind of say, you know what, maybe it doesn't always go right. But you know, this is how someone else, you know, respected person who's from the industry, this is how they picked up the pieces and made it work at the end of the day. And they got through it. It's okay to have those oh shit moments. At the end of the day, we all persevere. So with that, I uh, I turn the floor over to you, oh. sir. Oh, yeah, it's certainly okay to have the oh shit moments. And it's part of business, right? If you're not having them, then, you know, what, what are you doing, right? So, you know, I, I think about one time where we were working with a luxury retailer, you know, AR and VR was nascent several years ago. They were looking to launch a retail concept at Hudson Yards in New York City. And it was the first time we were building something of this nature. And the idea here was you could explore the luxury world of select Masons using an iPad with Apple world mapping, right? And, you know, it was very new technology at the time. And, you know, here we are, technology is just like threading the needle, we're getting it done. You know, opening the next day, stores being built out, everything. Now we're actually trying the application in the real world environment that is going to be opened up to the public tomorrow morning. And it's not tracking, right? And all of a sudden we're sitting there and we're freaking out. You know, it took an all-nighter, some very, very, very dedicated AAA engineers, debugging and figuring it out. And we got it to lock. When, when it opened, well, like how, how many hours left the space. How, how many hours before event do you think you pulled it off? Oh, man, I think we were working to the last minute, Freddie. Right? I think oh, it was, yeah. you know, I remember we did the ribbon cutting and, and the whole thing opened. And then Ash and our chief software architect, you know, these guys were exhausted. They're like, see you later. We're going home to go to sleep now, right? And like, they, they didn't even have to like watch the whole thing come to life at that point. They yeah, came back the next done. day. Yeah. Done. We'll watch a little video. That's awesome, man. Thank you for sharing. I always love a moment of humility and I've done my fair share all nighters, so I can appreciate that. Lucky, this is so great. If, if people want to learn more about you or your agency, what's, what's the best way for them to get in touch? I think a Twitter would be best or X. You can find me at LL Govindrum and you can find CXR at We Are CXR on X. Awesome. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And for those of you who tuned in today, I just want to say thank you again for tuning into OSHIP. I really appreciate your support of the show. If you want to learn more about OSHIP, go to OSHIPshow.com. You'll see all the different places we're broadcasting, whether that is across all primary audio streaming platforms where we've uh, recently crossed over 15,000 audio listeners or on any of the video platforms, whether that is Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, any place we can live stream, we're going to be streaming there. But we do love good old YouTube where we're actually over 7,000 subscribers now. So thank you for your support. Best thing you can do to support us is keep sharing, keep liking, keep telling your friends. And if you haven't already, click that subscribe button. Thank you so much. And Lucky, thanks again for being on our ship today. It was just a real pleasure to spend some time with you. Thank you. I'll see you around this week.